Uh, hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Melissa Kong, and I have the pleasure of representing the Executive Committee of the Oxford and Cambridge Malaysia Society today as your moderator. Joining us today are four wonderful individuals. I will first introduce, introduce Joan. Joan Fu Mahoney is the author of Millennials Meet Mary, The Extraordinary Life of a Universal Woman, Reflections by a Millennial Generation on a Unique and Timeless Treasury of Art. The book was launched at the end of May at the Vatican Museum. Joan is a Malaysian who today lives in Hong Kong and Kuala Lumpur. She began her career as a corporate lawyer in Tokyo for 10 years, followed by more years of lawyering in China, Hong Kong, New York City, and Boston. She retired in 2000 to pursue her passions, writing and charities. She's founded two publishing companies, JF Publishing and Cross Time Matrix, and reinvented herself as a writer. Joan has written the immensely popular book, Indispensable Qigong for People on the Go, and her family saga and life story, the historical fiction, Leaving the Heart Behind. She has also written, she has also been involved in many more books. Um, and for today's webinar, we have three of the 80 millennials that Joan has included in her book here with us today. Uh, first, we have Sa Safa Fadil al Sutagi joining us from Baghdad. Safa and her family went through hell in the conflict and wars in Iraq that have lasted for more than 20 years with long years of deprivation, with war and the imposition of UN sanctions. During the war, Safa lost her elder brother and then her father. Her mother was the first female member of parliament. Safa has been the youngest and only female board member of publicly listed companies, Baghdad Soft Drinks and PepsiCo. She was the former assistant to the president of Iraq and now she trains youth in business development programs at the UNDP Accelerator Lab in Baghdad, which she leads. She was also a Shevening Scholar at King's College London. Ricardo Acosta Latafi, I hope I got that right. Please correct me if I'm wrong. You got it right. Okay, perfect. Oh, okay, is joining us from Mexico City. Ricardo is currently working on scaling DD's operations into new markets in Latin America. So prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, you could find Ricardo anywhere from China to Mexico to Brazil. He holds a master's degree in engineering and project management, and also has an MBA from the Asia School of Business in collaboration with MIT Sloan. Ricardo started his career at Procter & Gamble in Mexico before joining Facebook as one of its first employees in Latin America, where he led the commercial partnerships with several companies in different industries. In 2017, he moved to Southeast Asia to pursue his MBA. Last but not least, we have Rachel Ng, who is joining us from Cambridge in the, in the United Kingdom. Rachel is Malaysian and has just finished her studies at Durham University. She will, beginning, she will be beginning postgraduate teacher training at Emmanuel College at Cambridge University this autumn. After her studies at Cambridge, Rachel's dream is to live as far away as possible from her comfort zone. A high achiever, Rachel is thinking of Japan since she also speaks the language. Welcome everyone and uh, I'm going to take a breath of uh, because I have just read a lot of introductions. <laughs> um, to the people tuning in on YouTube, thank you so much for joining us. If you have any questions for us, please let us know your name, where you're from, because we're expecting a very international audience today, and also who you would like to address your questions to. Okay. Um, I will now turn the floor over to Joan with the first question that I have for you. Tell us what inspired you to put together this book and why did you want to focus on Mary in particular? Well, thank you, Melissa, for such a lovely introduction. 
the for me and i think for lots of people the virgin mary is undoubtedly and indisputably the most painted woman in the world ever and as a writer as you have said i've written many books from historical fiction to gardens to art to qigong and and even uh, sailing you might say that my um taste in books is pretty catholic well millennials meet mary is literally a catholic book i am a roman catholic i am a devout and practicing catholic and and totally smitten by mary mary for me is a person who who is totally and whose story is totally remarkable i wanted to write about her story but there are thousands if not hundreds of thousands of books about mary so i decided to write this book about mary with art and i wanted to involve millennials because for me this was not just a book about mary i wanted to write the story of mary for young adults for young adults today they're secular they're more secular than spiritual but i feel that it's not because they they're hostile to spirituality i think young people are probably indifferent to it and i feel that this apathy can be addressed by art you don't need language for art so i decided to tell the story and i would reveal the story with artworks and then i would invite 80 millennials from 42 countries around the world to comment on the artwork and it it need not be from the perspective of an art historian is from their personal perspective and that makes it so much more interesting and what we have in the 428 pages of the book it's brimming with the most beautiful artworks from great museums all over the world but more important than the artworks it's alive with the stories the personal stories of these wonderful 80 millennials which you will see oh well, thank you so much and we'll also be sharing some of the art later on in the webinar so yes i'm so glad yeah so john that segues nicely into the next question what made you decide to have millennials give their commentary on the artworks instead of art historians or theological experts <laughs> okay um this is actually what i call my covid book i i started writing this book um in at uh easter of 2019 and i i already wanted my millennials to contribute and i do remember one of my friends the artist lh tan who actually gave me his beautiful artwork for the end paper telling me Joan you must be mad these are busy young people you will never get that commentary in time to publish a book but guess what the covid happened and all of them were free so <laughs> so they all wrote for me in record time my lovely 80 millennials i love them to bits they are uh ranging from royalty my grand godson in india um actresses like Karen Mok in Hong Kong, Raylin Shaw in Indonesia, wonderful entrepreneurs like Rosary Sanjo Joto, uh young students like Rachel, um anyway, um and of course you will see three of the most wonderful tonight as well. All of them from every walk of life, students, entrepreneurs, professionals, celebrities, but all of them had one thing in common. They are unique interesting individuals with 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 lives to share stories to share and and who were that each one of them was fascinated to meet mary of 23 bce this extraordinary woman of 2000 years ago was so interesting and exciting for the 80 millennials so 
I, I think it was wonderful. They were totally inspired. And um, in spite of the different backgrounds and religions, I have Hindus, Muslims, Catholics, atheists, agnostics, they were all there. They were all perfect because they, these millennials all want the same thing. They want a better world. They want to change the world and they want a peaceful world. And these millennials, if I could live again, I would like to be a millennial. They're exciting, they're fun, and they live in the fast age of the internet. So yes, um, I think that there was no question that um, I would love millennials to be in the book. Cool. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, as a millennial myself, I appreciate the love. <laughs> I don't often get it at work. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for sharing. Uh, the next question I have, uh, I think uh, when you talked about like uh, this book being a COVID book that segues, segues really nicely into the next question. Um, there has been widely noted success seen amongst women leaders in managing their country's COVID-19 outbreak compared to male-led countries. Through your book, do you hope that the historical perception of Mary will change? And do you think we might get a more balanced and female feminist interpretation of Christianity, perhaps? Well, you know, I do have a male in this group of millennials. Ricardo, you have to defend yourself here. <laughs> well, um, COVID. I have to say that the two best leaders in this world who are doing, showing the men how to lead are women. That's Nicola Sturgeon in Scotland, uh, who's the first minister, and, and um, Jacinda Ardern in, in New Zealand, the prime minister. It's amazing what they've done, and, and the rest of the world just messes around. But Aside from the COVID, and we're talking about Christ, Christian women leadership, I think that women in general and Christian women in particular do not need to prove anything. They actually make their impact in the world through their own feminine richness, just as Mary did. And in fact, I, I wrote about this in our Millennials Meet Mary Facebook, where I spoke about a millennial from Rome. Actually, she's a Spanish millennial called Marta Rodriguez Diaz. Um, she is one of the founders of the Institute of Higher Studies for Women at the Regina Apostolorum Pontifical University. And, and she said, and I quote her because she's lovely, one of the great challenges for the modern woman is to discover what it is to be a woman. Once a woman discovers who she is, she ends up discovering her feminine richness. And notice the words. I mean, it's fabulous, the combination of feminine richness, not feminist activism, um, not burn the bra, not me too. We don't need all of that. When you have feminine richness, as the Virgin Mary did, you have this softness, this gentleness, this um, beauty of spirit, which gave Mary courage and, of course, freedom. And that, that is what I think the modern woman has. And that's the Christian view of the world, Christian men and women, I think, if Ricardo agrees. I do. <laughs> Cool. Um, from the 80 millennials that you involved in the book, were any of their comments or reactions surprising to you? And can you share a little bit about what you learned from what they shared with you? Oh, I learned so much from those 80 marvelous, rare human beings. Um, I cried buckets of tears reading the, the, it was very emotional for me. I love them all. You know, they're all pretty special. It's not a case of Dalla Millennial. These people are, are my friend's children, my friend's grandchildren, my friend's friends. I know them all. And um, I, I selected and matched each piece of art with their characters and their personalities. So 
when they gave me their commentaries, it was very apropos their lives, which of course I knew about. And for example, um, I ran the whole gamut of emotions from heartbreaking and gut wrenching, as you will see when you hear Safa from, from Baghdad and also Fahad Mansour from Mosul and uh, the extreme joy of motherhood as uh, you will see in the chapter on on Mary's uh, as as a Madonna and a mother from Elise Morrissey in the USA and Christine Lau uh, in in Hong Kong and and oh great journeys refugees suffering from Astrid Pogosian and Malas Madani from Syria so all of this um, just broke my heart just threw me. I was thrilled, I was joyous. It made me think, oh my God, these are really, really wonderful, rare human beings. They humbled me with their compassion, their kindness, their, their tenacity, their brilliance. And I suppose that they, they do know and they cherish the full potential of their lives and, and they love the universe. I think they all still do in spite of COVID, in spite of everything they love the universe and perhaps they may need to know God more. I don't know, but perhaps also the wondrous artworks in the book will help them discover the, the beauty of creation. And in any event, it has been a rare privilege and, and joy, absolute joy for me to be working with the millennials. Perfect. I think, now is a great time to hear from the millennials themselves who are part of the webinar today. Um, so we'll follow, we'll try and follow the order of like Safa, Ricardo, and then Rachel. Um, Joan, feel free to chip in um, so that's more of a conversation. Um, can you all share with us how did you first meet Joan since it sounds like you all have like quite a personal history with her? Over to you, Safa. I think you're muted. Safa? Okay, she's muted. Hello. Um, I think I'm good now. Can yes. you hear me? Oh. Perfect. Um, thank you all for this amazing opportunity. And, um, and I would say to John that the feelings are similar. Like, I feel very... Um, happy and also i feel very enriched uh being part of this book so as, as much as you think that this meeting us as millennials added to you i believe the shared experience from you and also the artworks and everyone else and we're reading the drafts it was so enriching to us um if i address the question so it, to be honest i did not really meet john personally uh but um but it, it felt like I already met her personally because we, we I was first introduced her friend. through America. <laughs> yes, I, we were introduced through a very dear friend, and I would say he's one of my mentors uh, who has been there in, in many important decisions that I've made in life. And when he introduced John to me, to be honest, I Googled John, I saw the books she was writing. And then her email, when, when she wrote to me, and once I answered the email, she WhatsApped me. So it was not just formal and emails, but then immediately she WhatsApped me. She was like, I wanna, I want you to be part of this book because I want you to, I want to hear about your hopes and dreams and feelings, how it felt like to be uh, to go through all of this. I've heard about you a lot, but I wanna give you the opportunity to express yourself. And for me, that was you know, when you go through a lot of things, you try to put them in the back of your head and not really reflect upon them from time to time. But then John was there, was like, I want to hear your feelings and dreams. And that was actually thought because like I would send her a draft and then we would WhatsApp and then she would like, uh, now I feel you, now I know where this part fits you. So I think that was a very good transformation for me as well. So um, I'm going to cut in now and talk about why I chose the painting for, for Safa. Um, if you can put on the screen, this is a very, very 
incredible painting by Peter Paul Rubens it's called The Lamentation Triptych. And I, I knew that when I gave this painting to Safa, it might provoke a lot of emotions because of so much tragedy in her life. But I also know that Safa has this incredible positive spirit that she bounces back. And she lost her brother during the war. She lost her father. And Safa, you say in your own words what this painting brings up for you, because it's amazing what you have written in the book. Um, it's, you know, in or you remember I was texting you. I had, I went to uh, Amsterdam by my own and I sat there with my journals and I was like, now you can have the courage to actually look at this painting and write your comments about it. I know it's not for you, but you can have this courage to do it. And I remember being there for four days by my own, and uh, and then all the images of the things I went through that actually brought me that um, the heartbreak, that also brought me courage and change and ambition were right in front of me. And I remembered the moments when I heard that my brother was taken away from me or when I actually experienced life after my father and how tough that was. And it's, 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 it, it's very amazing to look you know, back 15 years ago, how that actually changed me as a person. And um, before I didn't used to tell people that um, I lost family members. Like I, I didn't have the courage to say it. And for this book, when I was writing the draft, I was like sending it to my friends. I was like, look, and some of them are like, we never knew this about you. Like, when did all of this happen? You always looked perfect and happy and you never addressed any of these things. So I think like, even like the image when I was looking at it carefully and how like, you know, the whole family and how we are treating the dead as a person who's already alive it's, it's been there, but I think it's not just the image that moves you, it's what happens afterwards. And since we all know Mary's life and how courageous she was, that transformation that actually heart to break and death brings you is I think something very valuable. I don't wish that it happens to everyone, to be honest, but I think it's very valuable that we appreciate it and we know that each and every change we go through we have two options. Either we can like just um, feel sad about it or we can actually take it to move forward. And it requires a lot of courage. And what, it, it took me, um, what, 13 years to actually speak up about it and say it. But I think I finally got there. Thank you for sharing your story, Safa. Uh... Yeah, I think especially the bit about the courage that you found um, through the process is especially inspiring. Uh, Ricardo, would you like to go next? Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, Safa's story is so touching that I don't know if I can speak about <laughs> uh, my painting after. But uh, thank you very much for, for having me as well. I met John as well through a mutual connection, who's Salina, uh, who's the senior director at Asia School of Business the graduate school in which I was doing my MBA last year in Kuala Lumpur. So I was just recently graduating when she made the connection with Joan. And I also got the email and the WhatsApp messages from Joan. There was an absolute immediate connection and I absolutely loved the work that she was doing with uh, Millennials Meets Mary. Uh, as a Catholic myself and coming from a, a Catholic family, I really connected uh, with uh, her passion on uh, and putting uh, Virgin Mary and uh, in, in, in a, a universal woman and getting these 80 millennials together and share their views on these beautiful paintings. So that really ca captivated me. And I am very humbled on having been chosen of one of Mary's millennials to participate in this book. Can we put up the Gilandeo painting so that, oh yes, here it is. So because Ricardo has some lovely commentary 
on on the calling of the apostles and very apropos what he's doing now uh, uh, as a influencer and in social media okay I, yeah i think the, the the paintings there now so you could you could see uh that's a beautiful picture that has so many details so uh i think similar to safa uh i think i i was just waiting for looking at this picture at the right moment. Uh, I think uh, when Joan shared the, uh, the, the painting with me, uh, I was traveling uh, a lot. I was overwhelmed with many things that I'm doing for work, but then just as looking at this painting, it, that it inspired me to try to understand uh, deeper on what are uh, the connections of the people that are out there. And I could recognize, uh, some people not by name but i knew that they were the apostles and the, uh, the it was jesus in this picture so i tried to investigate more and then just to found out that peter and andrew who were uh, two of the main apostles uh, from jesus and that were really close to him and i tried to compare that to who i am and who, uh, in which world do we live right now in which we always call uh, that we have like multiple friends in the context of social media we'll call them followers and we use this word a lot right like how many followers people have but then i try to understand wow like this is really uh like close people that were chosen by by jesus and what is the impact that they had with him and i think that's the commentary that i made uh, to this to this beautiful painting I think, Alisa, you're in mute. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> it does happen. Uh, thank you so much for sharing, Ricardo. Uh, last but not least, Rachel. Hi. Um, so, yeah, so I have the very uh, fortunate privilege to be Joan's niece. And so that's how I know her. She's also my one of the key role models in my life and one of the earliest memories I remember of her is like just her encouragement and passion for whatever projects I undertook so whatever writing aspirations I had she's always been a fundamental stepping uh, not stepping step but like, like um has been very very helpful um in helping me pursue my dreams and so I was very honored to be invited to, to join her book and to contribute to this wonderful project of hers and um, and just to, to meet so many highly accomplished people from the, so many different walks of life. Okay, I, I'm going to interject here because I gave Rachel a very difficult painting. <laughs> yeah. um, I've known Rachel since she was born and she's a little agnostic. Yes. Uh, so I gave her this painting by Vecchio, Palma Vecchio, on the, on the assumption of Mary and how doubting Thomas, the apostle who always wanted to have proof before he, he mm -hmm. accepts. So here is Mary on her way to heaven, throwing down her girdle for Thomas because he didn't believe. So I gave this little doubting <laughs> Rachel, the painting and she wrote a very beautiful commentary on on proof and faith and i would love uh, rachel to share it with us yeah so this painting actually really resonates with me because um i feel well not just me but quite um a lot of millennials today and young people are just well we're all embodiments of the doubting thomas and it's it's, it's just such a remarkable thing to me that um, to, to witness Christians um, being able to put their faith in something um, that they can't see or that they have no sort of verifiable proof of existence. And well, um, I used, as a child, I used to be quite religious. I think I was delving into Christianity and I read the Bible, um, like illustrated stories of the Bible, and that used to really interest me. But then somewhere along the way, I just started to question everything and well doing philosophy kind of built that a little bit more and just made me think and, and just wonder about all these um difficult questions and it's sort of spurred an interest in in studying how uh 
you know, people can sort of put their faith into something that they um, have no idea actually exists out there. So what I really, what I really liked about this painting was um, just the way the Doubting Thomas is portrayed here. See, if, I mean, it's a little bit small to see on screen, but in the background, he's sort of there desperately running towards um, the scene and presumably he can't see it, whereas all um, Jesus' other followers are so enraptured by it. And I think that's sort of like the situation that me and lots of other people, lots of other agnostics um, are in, because it's not like we're hostile to the idea of there being some kind of higher entity. It's just it's a, a difficult thing to reconcile um, with a logical, a very logical worldview. And what um, this painting did was actually prompt me to do a lot more research into the story behind it, um, into the story of, like the assumption of Mary's girdle. And in every, the, the story varies across different sources, but what's the one consistent thing about it is that um, in every version, there's always um, Mary and Jesus doing something to ensure that the doubting Thomas isn't left behind and that they're trying to do something to show that he is, that he's not forsaken basically and just and I think that's quite a reassuring thing to know you know like that even if you can't believe yet there's still um something out there and, and um, I have been doing a bit of research into spirituality and religion and I think that's like the, the painting is an interesting way of embodying those ideas of spirituality that I'm coming to term to it now so, yeah. That's indeed a very optimistic note, isn't it? It's, one, it's okay to doubt. It's definitely okay to doubt, yeah. Rick. But always yeah. don't forget God doesn't forsake us, right? Yeah. <laughs> I used to get into so much trouble as a child because I used to ask so many inappropriate questions. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, I think it's really nice to see how I think each piece of art means so much to each of the millennials. Uh, I do want to know, what was your initial reaction when you were first approached with the idea of this project? Uh, perhaps Saka, you can go first. Yeah. Um, to be honest, I was really scared. <laughs> I was, I'm, I'm not going to lie about it. Do you remember, it took me, um, it took me a while to get back to your email and and I, I once I looked at it and you know I read about it and I read about John and she wants people who, who will speak from the bottom of their hearts and then I was scared do I really want to go back to that and think about everything that happened how it got me here and think about the sources of my courage or um, like how I was able to get that courage, how I was able to move on. Do I really want to go through all of this? And uh, is it the right timing to do this, to get back all these feelings and emotions and reflect back on life? Because I think what I did, and this is one of, was one of my main achievements in 2019, to be honest, thanks to John, is that I had the time that was like exactly the right time. I got back from London. I got my job with the president's office. And this was the time I'm reflecting back on everything that happened from 13 years old till now. And is this actually going with um, what I planned for my life? Am I reaching my goal of like supporting people like me in such communities in order not to go through a lot of um, suffering in order to make their life easier. And I was scared to go back and look at all of that. It's, 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 I think the scariest thing is not actually skydiving or punchy jumping, but it's actually going into your own self and investigating what is happening. And are you actually um, doing something that's memorable in this world? And uh, and then that was the first this, like thing to scare me. The second thing was that, am I ready to share? Do I want to share with people? Um, what will people think about me if I share? Honestly, I'm, I'm not going to lie. I thought about all of these things. And will they start seeing me as something who's weak and not someone who is courageous and has that cheerful face? And, you know, 
all, all of these questions came to my mind. And then I remember like sitting there one weekend, I was like, look, this is like, you always want to share your story. You always want people to see that even if you go through really tough times, you can still smile. You can still be actually happy from the like bottom of your heart. And you can actually still be there for your family, friends, and community. And this is your golden opportunity to actually share that, not just with Iraqi people, um, but not not first not with your family, you know, like it was very important for me to share that with my brother and sister and my mother and then with the Iraqi people. And now like the whole world will be able to see this. So, um, so yeah, so, but I, I'm not gonna lie, even during writing my comments and my bio was, yeah, it was a lot of tough work. <laughs> cool. You did a good job, Safa. Thank Wonderful you. job. Thank you. Uh, thank you for sharing, Safa. I think before we move on to Ricardo, uh, we have a question from Saba from Iraq who asks, what inspired your inner courage? Um, I think us as women, and sorry, Ricardo, for that, but we already have courage inside us, and it's there. But some society implications forces you not to actually act courageously and just be the female virgin they portray or they, you know, they draw right there. So women don't actually discover themselves and know that they are courageous and get that inner courage out of them. So I think that was the first thing. It's actually in there. But then also the circumstances that I was put through, um, especially losing my father and then uh, not giving up on my dreams and wanting to get to, to be successful and to finish studies and to work. So that required me to add a little bit to that. And I would say it's having that motivation and drive is what gets that inner courage out and allow you to continue moving on. Thank you for a very poignant answer. Uh, Ricardo, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I think, yeah, hearing, hearing all the stories of different millennials, uh, made me question myself why why me and it's you you see Safa's story and and it's so uh, connecting and and so uh, emotional uh, for for all of us and then you also have these athletes and politicians artists entrepreneurs from Yangon to London to the US and then then I asked to myself like why me like I am uh, just a uh, normal engineer working as a businessman in, in in a technology company like why do i need to write about uh mary and and why joan uh, choose me so so i think that was the first question that i asked to myself but then i and this is also in a in a moment in which i was transitioning from like doing my mba in asia already moving to beijing uh, but when I got John's email, I was in Mexico City, where my family lives, and and I am very fortunate to have my grandfather, who is 95, and who taught us about Catholic values, and always talk uh, along with my grandmother about uh, Mary, and 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 Jesus. So I felt, wow, this is this is really connecting with me as well, and I think this is time for me to reconcile that part of those values, and and I do want to write about this. I don't know how to write. I am an engineer as well, so I hope I can put into paper uh, some of of my thoughts and and my uh, what I think about this painting. But I think it's not only on the commentary, but on the analysis and self reflection on how the religion and how Jesus and how Mary and how this universal context in which we are living in and, and all these different thoughts that, that you start to have and then trying to conciliate that and then yeah i don't know like the move the the, the world was moving too fast and also uh, i think when i finished my commentary as, as john was saying it was uh during COVID time right like we are just living this through new uh 
pandemic. Like we are all learning on how to deal with what's going on. Uh, and it was like a moment for me to stop uh, on this like super fast, uh, you know, life that we used to have, like moving a lot and then reflect on this and, and try to connect and understand how is, uh, who are who are the people that are important to us, uh, same as, as I, uh, I was reflecting in the picture with, with Mary and the Apostles. And I think that's why uh, I decided doing it. And that's how my uh, commentary uh, came to creation. Cool. Uh, Rachel, go ahead. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, so when Joan, when Auntie Joan first approached me about the project, I was really excited because, you know, I'd always wanted to to be an, an author. And then this was like, you know, the first step into uh, my first time being in a published book. But then that was quickly followed by a lot of apprehension and, and nervousness because, um, I mean, Ricardo was kind of humbling himself a lot, but I, I feel like everyone, especially Ricardo and, and Safa, they've endured so much, they've, they've seen so much of the world accomplished so much um and then I'm, I'm a student and i didn't know what else i could really add to the book but um it was an eye-opening experience to really meet people from so many from such an international background and see um life from so many different perspectives and points of view um and another thing i was quite nervous about was the fact that you know i didn't really hold any um, religious views, if anything, my religious views at the time kind of veered towards the negative um, because of all the things you read in the in the news, you know, how religion is being uh, manipulated as a weapon, a weapon to sort of, and distort just to propagate all these views. Um, so I kind of had really strong feelings that weren't particularly pleasant towards the religion. So I was, I was worried that whatever I was going to say was going to be really controversial. Um, and Aunt Joan probably knows because she gave me the first painting um, of the Virgin Mary as the as the Madonna, and <laughs> which um, <laughs> I had some views about that. Um, I've seen I've since changed my mindset. I feel like I'm this this project has really sort of brought me in a sort of personal journey to enlightenment in a way because. Um, I'm sort of always reflecting on my views and I, I don't have a complete belief about anything. Yeah, everything's just continuously changing like the COVID pandemic. Um, so yeah, so that, those were my feelings when first being approached in the project, but I'm really grateful for the opportunity because then this has sort of given a really good self-reflection opportunity for growth as well. And and Rachel has been all by herself in the UK <laughs> yeah. with yeah. the COVID. She couldn't come home, so mm. we miss you, Rachel, a lot. I miss you guys too. <laughs> cool. Okay. Uh, thank you for everyone's responses so far. Uh, the last question that I have uh, for Safa, Ricardo, and Rachel are to do more with, I think, the process um, in terms of how did you approach your answers? And I think Rachel already alluded to it a little bit, but like, what did anything change for you um, uh, during that process of uh, responding to the paintings that Joan provided to you? Yeah, go ahead, Safa. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. Uh, I think it's, it, so it gave me that realization that it's, you know, the whole process was not very easy, me trying to get all my emotions out and also with what I've done in my life and how, how they both were like incorporated together. And then it gave me the realization that I, I reached conclusions and I wrote statements in the in the commentary and in the bio that were not like actually on the top of my head at the time. But now it's more realization of myself. Yes, this is what I went through. I'm not ashamed of it. I used to be, I'm not anymore. This is the reason made me who I am today. And maybe if you come and ask me four or five years ago, I would say that I was not very proud of the person I am just because it's, there's like a lot of emotions and all of it, but now it's like, no, this, 
this journey, this tough journey actually made me want to accomplish, made me want to help others, made me get to the UN, made me get to try to be a trainer for women who are like in the south of Iraq, you know? It's this, this, this what actually got me that realization that this is a process and now it's matching together. So, and this is something I really, I really needed in my life. So, and also like through the whole thing, I was, I was, I was reading the bios and the comments of other people as they posted because we had like a shared Google Drive. So you can see all like the updates. And uh, I think this is something that I saw with different, um, with different people and their bios is that they're realizing who they became and how that paintings and how that uh, like comments made them reflect on their lives. So, so M Melissa, can I add that because I think that Safa is very humble uh, to add that, but she she left a very lovely job at the president's office to join the UNDP Accelerator Lab, where she actually helps young women uh, to start their own business, young people. And um, it's a wonderful thing you're doing, Safa, because you don't want any more young people to suffer like you did growing up. Actually, congratulations. Thank you. It was a tough decision, to be honest. But then I decided that going back to the community and enabling these people with amazing ideas. Too. You're a true millennial of Mary. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing, Safa. Um, Ricardo, what was your process like? Yeah, it's an interesting question. What, what, what was my reaction and process? Uh, to be honest, I need to confess that uh, I was very nervous to get my my, my painting and, and the one that Joan uh, chosen for, for us. Uh, I think the first time that I got the email, like uh, my first reaction was, Yes, I do want to participate, right? Like this sounds so global, so international. And as I was saying, it was connecting with me, with my background. But then uh, she said that I will be sending you soon a painting that I will personally select for yourself. And that's when I started to get nervous and say, wow, like this person that doesn't know that much about me, but it's already like reading my bio and it's already analyzing uh, some of my background and is gonna share with me. And she's expecting me to write uh, something that is around Mary, but it's not too religious and it's uh, connecting uh, more with me and my emotions. So, so I, I was really nervous uh, about that. But then when I got it, I felt an automatic connection and I have this gut feeling that I wanted to write something about the apostles that are there. Like, as I told you before, I didn't know who exactly they were, but then I, I, I got to know by some Google search and, and, and analysis with the author uh, to, to, to know that this, this painting was his, the Sistine Chapel in Rome. So that connected with me as well. And I tried to remind myself when I visited the Vatican and I think the last time was 10 years ago and I couldn't remember seeing, seeing that picture. But I really try to analyze it and, and reflect on, on human connection and who are these uh, people that are represented there. And that's what I decided writing about uh, the connection that the apostles have with, with, with Mary and with Jesus in the context of being uh, close with them, being friends uh, or calling them followers as we use in social media, as I mentioned before. So I think my, my, my reaction was uh, very fast but putting that into paper and, and writing that uh, down was not an easy process. But I think uh, there's there's a lot more that is it was in, in my in my head. And I, as I said, putting that into like a few words, in few paragraphs, and seeing all the other uh, commentaries that other millennials were doing, I then uh, realized that I was very humble on, on having this opportunity, and this was uh, the the contribution that I wanted to to give back to Joan and, and, and to the other 79 millennials uh, and, and the rest of the world. So I'm really humbled and, and, and grateful for, for this opportunity and participating. Thanks, Ricardo. I especially like the analogy you made between uh, Jesus's followers and 
uh, what we now have in the modern world. <laughs> I mean, I mean, if, if, if this is like, we're talking about two millennia ago, right? There, there's a world without internet and social media, even TV or radio, right? And in that context, like if you if you see like, uh, like Jesus has like 1.2 billion and this is Vatican official figure, right? 1.2 billion uh, base, right? Which is, if we compare to to any celebrity or, famous person and the internet, it's it's three or four times more uh, on this followers base, right? So so that's that's I think the incredible part of the Catholic uh, religion and, and in the in the global context in which we live and the importance that it has. So I, I really wanted to write about that. So thank you for, for that. Cool. Uh, Rachel, if you could share a little bit more. Yeah, so um, oh, I think the way I've changed in this process is to become a lot more of a, of a, an open-minded thinker because before I was more combative in my writings, I used to sort of think, um, think of things in a way that was intended to challenge them, um, just to demonstrate the falsity of the, the whole belief system. But then in examining this painting in particular, it kind of helped um, spur more research that I had said earlier into into the religion itself and how um you know you're not non-believers on forsaken um so I feel like I've changed in terms of my open-mindedness um when writing about when commenting on this painting and actually just looking just doing the reflection again now it's it's interesting to see the similarities between um, Christianity and sort of more spiritual uh, belief systems that um, don't go under any specific title or heading like those espoused by mindfulness gurus, you know, when they talk about presence and the higher consciousness um, and how, yeah, I think it, it's just really made me realise that perhaps religion isn't so much about believing in that entity or in the existence of something but in just it's a feeling you know I, it's difficult to articulate i'm still haven't arrived at a, at a complete at a fully form um and this conclusion of the whole thing but this is basically what has been inspired by this one painting and i think so joan's project is just so incredible in the way i've been able to do this not just for me but for um, the other millennials who have contributed to this book um and yeah it's a I think it's a very fundamental uh, growth process that I've achieved through examining the paintings. Well, I think it's rather wonderful to see how artworks can have such a huge impact on on the viewers' emotions and how it lifts their spirits and and changes their whole perspective. It's wonderful. Yes, very true. Um... I have time for two more questions from the audience before we wrap up because we've got about seven minutes left. So I'll share Sorry. both the questions. I'll share both the questions um, so that um, people have time to also think of their responses. Um, the first question is from Elizabeth. I believe it's directed to Joan, um, but I think if others want to chip in, feel free to. So Elizabeth shares that uh, Joan has included millennials of various religious backgrounds to embrace the idea of writing about an absolutely Catholic icon. Uh, did you, Joan, suffer any negative responses to this project? Uh, the second question I have that I will quickly read is from Sabah, again, uh, from Iraq. And this is directed to Ricardo. Uh, Sabah asks, what do you think is human connection based on the painting. Uh, okay, since there is one last question, I will quickly read that as well. Um, and that will be the last question that we take from the floor. Uh, there's a question from Hugo. Um, I'm not sure where you're from, but uh, this question Portugal. is there. Oh, from Portugal. Okay, mm -hmm. Hugo from Portugal. Uh, he asks, Rachel, having no specific beliefs, what was it like to reflect on an iconic figure of one certain religion. 
Right, so I will go first. Um, Elizabeth, you wanted to know if um, there was any negative response to the project. You mean from any of my millennials, obviously. Um, actually, I asked more than 80 millennials, knowing that there is an attrition rate. But actually, I had only two people who, who couldn't write, one, person backed out at the last moment because of work and and the other one was away somewhere on on safari and just didn't have time but no one actually said to me that they didn't want to write because it was uh not something they believed in because i i always stressed from the very beginning that this was not a religious book um, this was going to be a book about a very remarkable woman who lived 2000 years ago and, and I wanted to people to to write through about the art and about themselves so um no I mean I was actually very surprised that um I didn't have a single negative remark not one which is wonderful or maybe they they had but they didn't dare tell Auntie Joan you know so I don't know <laughs> The next one is for Ricardo to answer, I think. Yeah, I think I will go really quick on that one so we can take the other questions. But I think human connection is not just represented in these paintings, but in any other paintings. Like, as John was saying, it's not just the uh, religious aspect of it, but also the historic aspect of it, right? So if we could learn more about the people that is represented there and the love that they have for Jesus, I think where's, that's where the connection exists. That's where you see the humanity, right? And you can see them under bending underneath uh, in this picture, and sorry, in this painting, and then like all these other people looking at them and, and, and you feel connected. Like that, that's how you, you see this humanity. Like you can see that there's, there's some, some connection there. Thanks, Ricardo. Uh... Rachel? Hi, yeah, sorry, um, connection issues. Um, yes, thank you for the question, Hugo. Um, so yeah, I didn't look at it from a specifically religious point of view. So um, I kind of did it as a academic intellectual study. So um, it was, I think it was actually really helpful that I didn't have any predisposition towards one religion or another when approaching this project, because then it helped me um, look at it with more open mind and I would wouldn't otherwise have had if I was already you know inclined towards uh this religion or the other so I think it would I think there was a follow-up question as well like what would it have been difficult challenging for me to come in in a different figure from another religion and I don't I think it would have been the same procedure because I've op um, approached them both with the same neutrality as I would uh, an academic study so it was interesting to look at it in that light and yeah Okay, um, this is my final question to everyone. What were some overarching conclusions that you reached from the project? Um, I think maybe Safa, you can go first and then we'll end with Joan. Um, we all somehow share similar stories. We all have somehow uh, know about each other and know how each other feeling. It doesn't really mean like Iraq or different person, like even from previous generations and marrying 2000 years ago, it's eventually there are like these similarities that run across and being part of this international network of millennials is so privileged. So yeah, I think this is the conclusion I reached. Ricardo, what are your takeaways? Yeah, I think it's, it's very similar on Safas. On um, It's a great privilege to be connected. I think we live in a world that made uh, this possible. Like I am absolutely amazed on how many people from different backgrounds and different countries, like John was able to put together in the book. So, so I think that comes back to the, the current world in which we live. And, and also like reflecting on those like, 
two millennia ago in which Mary lived and how it's a small but and also a global world there was and how it has evolved right now. So very privileged to, to be selected on, on, on this project. Yeah, so similarly, I think, um, like Ricardo was saying, it's it's quite interesting to observe how traits from, from more, like over two millennia ago are still so much relevant today, like traits that Mary has and or embodies throughout the, the Bible and that's captured in these paintings. It's interesting to see how relevant they still are today and how we are still able to resonate with her values. Um, and I think that's the core of the religion, basically, is what, inspires in you as an individual um, and that's my key takeaway from the project and um i have the last word as usual it's great <laughs> well i think my the overreaching conclusion that i can make from this writing this book with all these wonderful 80 millennials is that wow if it, going back to the COVID analogy Jesus Christ is the super spreader of love and compassion. So are uh, all our millennials, all Mary's millennials, super spreaders of all that's good and kind and wonderful in this world. And that's a wonderful way to interpret the, the impact of this book. And before we end, Melissa, Elizabeth, Sean, Emma, I would like to thank the Oxford and Cambridge Society in Malaysia for giving us the opportunity to present the book. Uh, the book is available free online, download on the website, Millennials Meet Mary, but the printed book is also a, will be available in a month and a half and uh, watch the website for information. Um, you can actually have 428 pages of full color artwork and, and the thoughts of the millennials and it will be translated in Spanish and um, Brazilian Portuguese very soon. So thank you so much, Oxford and Cambridge Society. My husband is from Oxford. So today he's overrun by Cambridge people, but he doesn't mind. He loves them all like me. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, so that concludes our webinar for today. Uh, thank you so much to Joan, Safa, Ricardo and Rachel for joining us from many different parts of the world. Thank you also to all the viewers who are tuning in from wherever you are. And special thanks to Sean in the background, whom you can't see, who has been making sure that everything runs smoothly from a tech perspective. Uh, and I wish everyone a good night or a good morning or a good afternoon, depending on what time it is, wherever you are. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. 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 Bye.